who the Word of God describes in verse number 1, came and invaded Judah. He came and invaded Jerusalem where he took Israel and brought them into captivity in Babylon. The Word of God reminds us again that for over 200 years, the prophets of God stood and preached the Word of God reminding Israel that they had broken the law of God. They had forsaken the day of worship. They again had put up false idols in high places and they had forsaken the poor and forgotten the widows. And God called them to repentance and that he would forgive their sin and heal their land if they would pray and come before the Lord. Yet they refused and became stiff-necked and hard-hearted against the Lord. For over 200 years, God preached to them and taught them the word to repent of their sin. Yet there was no repentance. The day of captivity had come, and Jehoiakim, reigning as king there, was carried off into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar into the land of Babylon. Now, church, this morning, as you look, we learn lots today from Daniel. 2,500 years ago, Daniel made a stand for God. 2,500 years ago, the Word of God says he purposed in his heart that he would serve the Lord. And there's some things that we learn here from the Word of God that are very important to us today as we look at this first nine verses. When the time came for the delicacies of the king to be put before Daniel, Daniel asked Aspenaz to bring him bread and water for ten days. He and his three friends prayed and sought the Lord and sought the counsel of God that they would know how to stand and purpose in their heart they would serve the Lord. This morning from the book of Daniel, I want you to look with me at three very important things when it comes to a time to stand. It warns us in the first, first five verses as we look in the book of Daniel of this. Number one, there is the danger of friendly captivity. Babylon is known as the land of Shinar. It's the land that God called Abraham to leave in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And I just want to remind you as a Christian today that the enemy always wants to take you back to a land that God has called you to leave. The enemy always wants you to come into friendly captivity and there could be nothing more dangerous in the life of a Christian than friendly captivity. Nothing could be more dangerous to hear these words that you'll hear in these first few verses as you hear, sit with us, eat with us, drink with us. You'll hear the words that are endangering these Hebrew men as a totalitarian state is being proclaimed upon them. Isolate them from who they are. Induct them into a culture that will call them to compromise and bow down to the false gods in that land. You'll notice in verse number 4, the Word of God says that they wanted men who were quick to understand, who would learn in the king's palace a new language and a new literature of the Chaldeans. They were looking for good-looking young men that they could influence and indoctrinate. Daniel, at the age of a young 16, standing there in the palace with his three friends that we learn from here in the Word of God, how the enemy would love to make a deal with them according to verse number 5. For three years, they would be called into friendly captivity to have wealth with the king, to have wine at the king's table, and to have all the desires of the palace that they could ever hope to have. What an influence that must have been on a young man, Daniel, at the age of 16, to know he could have all the wine, all the wealth, and all the women of the palace. I was reminded when I read that again this week that one of uh, my preacher friends years ago, an old godly saint who's been with the Lord now for several years, told me one day in his office, he said, he quoted something from Adrian Rogers, and he said, Pastor Ravi, if you really want to have a ministry that will honor God, remember this. Never get trapped by gold, by glory, and by girls. I think about that when I think about Daniel here. 
because Daniel was enticed to come into the king's palace, learn a new language, and set learning the literature of the Chaldeans. The Word of God tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse number 1, it reminds us that the Bible says, come and eat with us. Come throw your bag in with us. Come and be friends with us. Come, let's throw all of our stuff together. There will be no restrictions. And I'm reminded that God has called us to separate from this world. I'm reminded today that God has called us to leave the land that he's called us out of. I'm reminded this morning that God destroyed the yoke of bondage in my life. Why would I want to go back to a land that tried to keep me captive when God has set me free? I'm reminded this morning when I think about Daniel, that Daniel on his journey as he was leaving Jerusalem, headed into Babylonian captivity, that Daniel that that time would be persuaded to take on a whole new culture, a whole new language, whole new literature that for 16 years he had been trained for in his life. What would Daniel do in a day like this? 2,500 years ago, Daniel at the age of 16 was being called to make a stand for God. And the Word of God says that Daniel desired in his heart in his heart, not to go into that friendly captivity. Even though he was going to be captive in the land of Babylon, the Word of God says he's purposed in his heart that he's not going to be attached to Babylon. So the Word of God teaches us, first of all, as a reminder this morning, that there is a danger a friendly captivity. But I want you to know, second of all, if you look at verses number six and number seven of this, the doctrine of a Babylonian culture. Now church, watch how this happens in verses six and seven. Intense pressure would be put on this young man of age 16. An indoctrination to a worldview versus his Christian view. A culture that desires, and you'll notice this, to strip his identity and his integrity. Notice what the Word of God says they did. Look at the Bible real closely. The Bible says in verses 6 and 7 that they took the sons of Judah and they desired to give them new names to indoctrinate them into their culture that all gods were acceptable. The Word of God says they changed each one of them's name, the three Hebrew boys, and Daniel would be given Babylonian names after the gods of Baal, Marduk, and Nebo. First thought here was to educate them. Now train them in a new heritage and take away their heritage of God. Let me tell you what Daniel knew about this when he came to that tent table. Daniel knew that these people, the, the Babylonians, Daniel knew that the food that would be set before them was food that had been offered up and sacrificed to the false gods of the king of Babylon. Now let me tell you why this is important, church. You may not understand this in this culture or this day, but in the day that Daniel lived in, the culture he lived in, to sit down at a table and eat with them meant joining with them. If he sat down with them, he joined with them in serving their gods. He joined in them with their language, their literature. He stripped himself of his identity as a Christian so that he could have the identity of Babylon. But Daniel had purpose in his heart that he was going to serve God. Think about this this morning, church. Teenagers, young men who've been separated from their families, influenced by the government, Taught secularism in the schools. Taught unethical business practices so they could rule the world. Then put into media outlets to promote a godless society. Church, what you see in Babylon is what's happening in America today. Come join with us. Let's throw all the gods in the ring and we'll have a hybrid society that you serve or do whatever you want to do. And Daniel saw right through this. The Word of God lets us know this. And Daniel gives us a great word this morning. And here it is, church. I want to give it to you. Daniel knew in this culture, if he sat down and became friendly with gods of this world, it would be harder and harder to lead that table. I want to tell you something this morning, church. There's a culture that wants to separate the family. 
A culture that wants to give us a secular government. A culture that wants to teach us a different language and literature. A culture that wants us to sit down with the false gods of this world. And a culture that wants to indoctrinate us with the doctrine of a culture that anything goes, anything exists, do whatever you want to. There is no God. Church, I'm reminded when I look at Daniel this morning that Daniel knew what he had purposed in his heart was a heart that was full of the doctrine of God and that he would have to stand against a Babylonian culture that was indoctrinating him to a practice of worshiping false gods that would destroy his life. And he knew if he ever sat down and became friendly with that, he would sit down getting harder and harder and harder to leave. And so the Word of God reminds us of something here, church, as you look at verse number 8 and 9. Now, what says? In verse number 8, the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart. It means Daniel made a decision. The Word of God means here that the decision of Daniel was not to compromise. He had already purposed in his heart. Now, this is a good word. From the Word of God in the Hebrew here, the word for heart means lieb. Lieb. And it means this. It means that not only did Daniel purpose in his heart, That he was going to serve God. But he had purpose in his heart, his mind, and his will and emotions that he was going to serve God. He had purpose in his life that God's conviction of his word would reign and rule in his life. And God brought him into favor in that place. Now watch this. When you look at these four Hebrew boys, think about this this morning. We see Daniel. We see the other three boys that are mentioned here. We see Daniel, and we know him best by this thought this morning. We know him best by, in chapter 6, he faces the lion's den. We know him in chapter 6 that Daniel, when he's told not to pray, opens the windows wide and prays in his Hebrew tongue that as many of the Jews are walking underneath his window, they can hear him praying to the only God of the universe. Daniel praying with all of his heart unto the Lord because he's already purposed in his heart that he will serve God. He's purposed in his mind that he'll renew his mind in the promise of God. He's purposed in his will to surrender himself to the will of God. And he's purposed himself in his emotions not to get attached to what everybody else is doing, but to do what God has called him to do. Church, I want to tell you this this morning. Many times in your life, you're going to face a lion's den. Many of you this morning, you're going to face a time when you are told not to do something when you know God has called you to do something for His glory. Some of you this morning may be facing a lion's den in yourself right now. And what happens to many people in their life, if they haven't purposed in their heart that they're going to serve God, they get overwhelmed by the lion's den. But Daniel was never overwhelmed by the lion's den because Daniel knew God was in charge. And Daniel had already purposed in his heart he was going to serve God. Think about this this morning, church. When we look at Daniel, we know him by his Hebrew name. But when we talk about the other three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're mostly known by their Babylonian name. Now think about this this morning, church. How deep was the indoctrination of that Babylonian culture? How deep were they trying to pull them and separate them? Even me, during that time, tried to separate Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. They were standing in a different plane in a different day than Daniel was. And the Word of God teaches us that in Daniel chapter 3, these men faced a fiery furnace. We often know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But their real Hebrew names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the Word of God says on a day when they struck up the band and called everybody in the land to bow down and worship the God of Nebuchadnezzar, these three Hebrew boys stood. They made a stand for God because they had already purposed in their heart that they would serve the living God. Church, I want you to notice this morning something. We're all going to face a lion's den. We're all going to face a fiery furnace. But the question is, is what have we purposed in our heart before we face these things? We're going to face a culture that is against us. We're going to face a godless society. You think about it this morning, teenagers who've been separated from their families, influenced by the things of this world. How could these young men stand knowing they have purposed in their heart something great? Great for God. 
Think about this this morning, church. These men were educated. We know they had at least three years of college experience in Babylon. These men worked for the government. These men made a great living, but they did not compromise. Now, I want you to listen closely this morning. I believe that the Lord spoke to my heart something very clear from this word this week. There is a time to stand in our life realizing that we have purposed something in our heart to serve God and that God is going to give us a platform somewhere, a platform to honor Him, to glorify Him, a platform in this world, a platform to stand upon our convictions, and a platform to promote the kingdom of God. Never did Daniel compromise who he was or where God had even called him at that time from the platform that God gave him to promote the kingdom of God. You know what it reminds me of, church? It reminds me of this morning that we should stand. There's a time in our life to stand. And I believe if we look here closely this morning, we'll learn what God is speaking into our lives 2,500 years after Daniel. First of all, let me say this this morning. We should stand. And we should stand today for the family. Because many of our teenagers are being separated from our families today and indoctrinated with a culture in this world that's telling them we are a godless society. But today, I believe we should stand for the family. And when I mean stand for the family, I mean this. I mean that we should stand for the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of the womb, the sanctity of the home. While the Supreme Court sets and tries to decide what a marriage is, I want to say to the Supreme Court from about us to Georgia today, the vote has already been cast in heaven and God has already declared that marriage is one man, one woman under God, connected in Jesus' name. That's the definition of marriage today. We should stand for the family and when I mean stand for the family, I mean this. We should stand for the unborn. The womb is sacred unto God. The womb is the place where the baby is alive and very much alive. And we should stand today as not a nation of pro-choice, but a nation that is for the unborn. And we should lift up the child in the womb and declare that is life. And we should, as the church, stand as pro-lifers. We're also a nation today that sees the influence of an education system upon young men and women. We see at age 16, Daniel's introduced to a culture, a language, a literature that is totally opposite from his Hebrew heritage. Yet Daniel purposed in his life to take that education and turn it and use it for the glory of God. I want to say something this morning. Don't you listen closely. We have a lot of school teachers in our church. We've got a lot of administrators. We've got a lot of principals and vice principals who go to Northside Baptist Church. And let me say something this morning. God bless the men and women who in this day and educational system have made a stand that no matter what they are told to be taught, they know there is a God in heaven and they stand for the God of heaven, the God whose name is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they live out what they believe. They stand on what they believe. And God bless our teachers in America again. Amen. God bless our teachers. I thank God for them. And let, let me tell you why I say this this morning, church. I believe with all my heart, the platform that Daniel was given here was a platform in a godless society that he could promote the kingdom of God. God has given everyone in here a platform of some kind. It may be a desk. It may be a job. It may be a place where in the palace you work. It may be a place at your work. It may be a place with your neighbor. It may be a place at your school. But God has given you a platform. And let me say this this morning, and I'm going to say it with deep compassion conviction and maybe hush but God bless our young people that they would be trained up in the word of God and at the age of 16 in their lives put in their heart that they were going to serve God and turn this nation around again for the glory of God let's believe in our young people today and lift them and encourage them that today they can change the course this nation is on I believe with all my heart there's some Daniels in our church.
I believe with all my heart, mind, and soul that when we purpose in our life what Daniel purposed in his life, his heart, his will, his emotion, his mind to the heart of God, that God watched over Daniel. God protected Daniel on that day. It's never declared from the Word of God that Daniel ever left those 70 years in Babylon. But oh, the impact Daniel had on Babylon. Oh, the impact we'd have today on our culture where we stand with God. Oh, the impact we would have in our lives today if we would purpose in our heart that we will serve the Lord. Let me ask you this morning, what have you purposed in your heart? Like Daniel, I purposed in my heart God's Word, that I will not sin against God. I purposed in my heart to make a stand for God that no matter where I am, no matter what situation I'm in, I know the God who will deliver me. I know the God in which I stand today. I know the God in which I purposed in my heart that I will not be pulled back into a Babylonian culture, but I'll serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. Yes, I will stand. I think about Daniel this morning, and I want to say to the body of Christ today, what have you purposed in your heart? What have you purposed in your heart in these days? With 2,500 years later, we talk about the, that, that today is not relevant to the Word of God. In those days, 2,500 years ago, I'd say our society hasn't changed a whole lot. I would look today and say, what have you purposed in your heart? I'm going to ask you to do this this morning. I'm going to ask you, if you will, bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. And as we do this morning... If you will, I want you to get as silent before the Lord and not move for just a moment. But I want to ask you this morning, what have you purposed in your heart? What have you purposed in your life before the Lord this morning? Because there are going to be some times that we face a fiery furnace. There's going to be times in our life where there's a lion standing in front of us. There's going to be times we're told not to pray. Not to believe in God. There's going to be times in our society that we stand against a godless society. Daniel never raised a picket sign. Daniel never went and, and, and had a debate. Daniel made his stance in the Lord. He purposed in his heart to simply serve God. He just simply stood. And this morning, church, before we ever sing a song, before we ever let our lips move any, in any kind of music, I want to ask you this morning, what have you purposed in your heart? Maybe this morning we see from Daniel what we saw in Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe in Daniel we see what we see in Moses. Moses drew a line in the sand. He said, every one of you who are for the Lord, stand on this side. And those against over there. What have you purposed in your heart? I've purposed in my heart this day that I will stand for the Lord. And I want to ask you this morning, before we ever give a hymn of invitation, would you purpose in your heart to stand for God this morning? And if you will, I want you to stand right where you are. Nobody's looking around, but I will stand for the Lord. Would you stand this morning? Before you look around, before we sing anything, I will stand for the Lord. I will purpose in my heart that I will serve God. Do you know how exciting it is, church, when a pastor looks out and knows the whole congregation stands saying, we will serve the Lord. I purposed in my heart that I will serve God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we make our stand. And having done all, we stand strong in the Lord, purposing in our heart this day. But this day, as for our house, and as for the house of Northside Baptist Church, we will stand for the Lord. To God be the glory. What you will do in this church as the bride of Christ stands with its wonderful groom. May we be a lighthouse. This city may know the God we serve. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Uh, this morning, as we give this invitation, if you're here today, you've never surrendered your heart to Christ, then I want to invite you to come this morning. Start this morning by purposing in your life, I'm going to give my life to Christ today and be saved. If you're here today and you would like to stand with the church in these days, and you want to be a part of this family, we'd love to have you this morning as we sing.